This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Boxed cake mixes have characteristics that we simply cannot recreate here in the home kitchen using conventional ingredients. Why is that the case, and how does it affect the finished baked results? Well, we're going to do an experiment where we bake the same cake two ways. We're going to talk to a scientist about the surprisingly sophisticated contents of this box, and we'll interrogate the philosophical questions raised by all of this, including what's the point of making anything from scratch? Field trip to the Mill Hill Community Arts Center in Macon, Georgia, where the Mill Hill Bakers Collective is run by my friend Adriana Horton. It's a low-cost shared kitchen space for indie bakers who have their own respective businesses. Adriana's business is the Oh Honey Baking Company, and she makes my favorite cake, which is a cookies and cream cake. First, she's gonna make it from her favorite box mix. One chocolate and one vanilla to make an Oreo cake. Duncan is my main squeeze. It's just the most consistent, and it tasteless like chemicals. You just mix in some eggs, water, and oil. I really like to whip my batter. Um, a lot of people say that you can over mix. But this whipping stage, which the instructions tell you to do, is absolutely key, especially for boxed mixes. That's according to Dr. Rebecca Miller-Regan, a professor of bakery science at Kansas State University. So in order to get the cake to rise and to have a nice crumb grain, it's critical to get air into that batter during mixing. That's the only place it comes from. A lot of people think that the chemical leavening, like your baking powder or baking soda, makes the air bubbles. It doesn't. Dr. Miller says this chemical reaction merely makes CO2, which inflates existing air bubbles. When you bake a cake from scratch, there's often a stage called creaming, where you beat solid fat to create air bubbles within it. But with a box, the solid fat, shortening in this case, is already mixed in there, so there can be no creaming stage. The contents of this box have been formulated to be whipped in their entirety without going tough, the way that potentially a cake batter that you made from scratch could go tough if you overmix it. If your boxed cakes aren't coming out well, Dr. Miller suspects it's because you're not following the instructions that tell you to beat the batter for a good two minutes after you get everything incorporated. With continued mixing, it breaks the bubbles that are incorporated into smaller sized bubbles. So you get more bubbles that are smaller in size that make a nice fine uniform grain in your final cake. And these are the mixed cakes and you can really see the difference because the mixed cakes are so smooth and perfect and the scratch cakes have bubbles and more like a crust and cracks on top of them. But how do they taste after we get them all decorated? Well, you can see how soft the box cake is, and it tastes very sweet. Too sweet to my taste. Now here's the scratch cake. It's not as fluffy, but it has more of a body to it. I would go so far as to call the chocolate version of Adriana's scratch cake clearly superior to the chocolate box cake. It's just fudgier, richer, more substantial. But the softness of the white cake from the mix is just like incomparable. Box cake is very sweet, but the soft consistency is definitely a win for science <laughs> because you can't recreate that with a scratch cake at all. It's just impossible. And why can't you? Well, Dr. Miller says it comes down to three big factors. The emulsifiers that are in this box, there's the fats that are in this box, and specifically how they're integrated into the rest of the mixture, and then there's the kind of flour. We'll start with the first thing, the emulsifiers. An emulsifier is any ingredient that allows two or more liquids to mix together and stay mixed together, even if they don't want to. The big example would be oil and water. They kind of reject each other on a chemical level. I can smush them together with brute force, but this mixture is unstable the water and fat will eventually separate. Now, if I mix in an egg yolk, I can get a smooth and stable emulsion. Egg yolks contain lecithin, a molecule that can join up with water on one end and with fat on the other end. And there, it's the bond between the two warring camps. The high-tech emulsifiers that are in this box allow the batter to hold on to more water and oil than it normally could. That'll get you a more moist texture, and crucially, the emulsifiers allow the batter to hold on to more bubbles that would otherwise just pop. So in your commercial cake mix, it has the right type of emulsifiers that help the air to be, the air is going to be trapped, but it helps hold the air bubbles in the aqueous or water phase of the batter. But when you are making it at home, you don't have those specific 
type of emulsifiers available. We do have some options in here, for example, egg yolks. That's why recipes for particularly rich and moist cakes often call for extra egg yolks. It's for the emulsifiers that they have. Dr. Miller says you can also look for shortening that has some of these more high-tech emulsifiers in it. Not to advertise for Crisco, but that's what we have here. And it, it will say on there that it has mono and diglycerides in it. Those are an emulsifier. So it works well because that helps to stabilize and get more air whipped into the shortening phase. And indeed, we see mono and diglycerides mentioned right here on the Duncan Hines box. There's other emulsifiers you can buy, like soy lecithin, but what are the odds that you're going to come up with a better formula than all of the highly paid, highly educated food scientists that they have working at ConAgra, doing thousands and thousands and thousands of experiments to nail the perfect formula that gets you a perfectly reliable cake every single time? Science. It's like magic that works. Now let's talk about the fats in here. Cakes often have a mixture of solid and liquid fats. In this case, the box tells us to add our own veg oil, but the solid fat, the shortening, is already in the box. Shortening is great because it has a long shelf life. It doesn't have any water in it like butter does. Dr. Miller says the problem with shortening is that it breaks foams, the air bubbles that we're talking about, but science has a solution. All the dry ingredients and the shortening go through this cake finisher, which kind of just smears the shortening on the flour particles. So if you take a cake mix and you kind of like grab a handful and squeeze it, it'll kind of stick together. That's why, because of the shortening. So that's how they get enough fat for great flavor and soft texture, uh, because it's, it's done that way. Because if they just had free shortening, uh, then it will break the foam and you won't be able to get as much air whipped in. And now we come to the flour itself. Box cakes are typically what bakers call high ratio cakes, meaning that they actually have more sugar in them than flour because A, people like sugar, B, because really sweet cakes tend to keep for longer and the shortening helps with that too, and C, really sweet cakes are stronger structurally. You can build multi-layer cakes out of them without their air pockets collapsing and the bites will be less crumbly on your fork. So when you have a high ratio cake, which has so much sugar, then the flour used for that is typically chlorine treated. So what the chlorine does is it changes the properties of the starch in the flour. So it oxidizes the starch and that changes how the starch is able to absorb water. It can now soak up and hold a lot more water. And those oxidized starches are better at holding everything together in a nice structural mesh and preventing the cake from collapsing under the weight of the sugar, the water, or any additional layers that you're putting on top. The flour has also been milled more finely than normal flour, probably through a process called pin milling. So after they make the flour, they'll put it through a special little mill with little pins that really break down the particle size. So it's a very, very fine particle size. And if you kind of feel it, you would, it would just feel real silky. That again helps the flour to gel in the water and create that superior structural mesh to hold all the other ingredients. Now you can buy super finely milled chlorinated cake flour at the store. But again, an army of lab coats have specifically formulated the flour in here to work synergistically with all of the other ingredients in here. What are the odds that you're gonna top them? And indeed, even though very few will publicly admit to it, some professional cake bakers do use boxed cake mixes, at least as a base. They might add additional things to it. That's what Dr. Miller does at home. My baker friend Adriana says a box cake can be a huge time saver in a commercial context. It just takes a sec to mix and it bakes faster, probably because it's less dense. But she says there are some styles of cake that should never be made from a box, like say pound cake. Pound cake is supposed to exhibit the opposite of all of these traits that we get from a box. It's supposed to be uh, more dense and I love the crust that's on top and box cakes don't give you that. Box cakes have a very thin um, kind of film on top, but it is not, it's not a true crust like a scratch cake. But let's assume for the sake of argument that your goal is to create a cake with the characteristics of a box cake, something that's light, fluffy, and very sweet. Is there any reason in that case to not bake from a box? Is it <gasps> cheating? 
There's a famous historical anecdote about this. Lots of cake mixes used to have dehydrated eggs in them. All you had to do was add water. Then, in the mid-20th century, a famous psychologist and marketing expert named Ernest Dichter suggested that manufacturers should try leaving out the eggs. That way, housewives would feel less like they were cheating. There'd still be some work for them to do. So that's what the manufacturers did, and then sales skyrocketed. At least that is the story. Reality is probably a little more complicated than that. If you want to know more, I recommend this book by food historian and journalist Laura Shapiro. It's linked in the description. But anyway, the moral opposition to cake mixes is an example of what I would call the feeling of virtue without the substance of virtue. Hardship, self-sacrifice, these are virtuous things when we do them in service of a cause, like, say, someone else's well-being. Like, if I go hungry so that my kids can have food to eat, that's virtuous. But what if I refrain from eating purely because I want to look a little bit better on TV? This is not a hypothetical scenario. I'm literally doing this right now. I want more of that cake so bad. It feels virtuous because virtue often involves denying yourself something that you want. But for whom am I sacrificing? What cause am I serving? The cause is purely my own vanity, and I don't think that's virtuous. I mean, I don't think it's bad either, it just is. Likewise, I don't think there's any real virtue in making your own dinner or dessert the hard way. It's merely the feeling, the illusion of virtue. So, if I want a cake with these characteristics, I am baking from a box. But I don't always want a cake with these characteristics. In fact, I really preferred Adriana's scratch version of that cookies and cream cake. And yes, the recipe for that cake will be my next release. I'm so grateful that Adriana was willing to share her hard-earned cake skills with me. And guess what? There's a whole website like that, full of people like that. It's called Skillshare. It's an online community where instructors share all kinds of creative and entrepreneurial skills that you can use to enrich or perhaps even change your life. As much as I clearly believe in the value of YouTube tutorials, Skillshare classes are much more than that. They go way deeper, they're interactive, you have assignments, and they're structured. You're not adrift cobbling together bits from this source and that source. Some people learn well like that, but most people learn better in a structured environment with a logical flow. Say you want to learn something harder than cake. You want to learn how to design user experiences, you know, user interfaces for products. You can take Marika McCloskey's Intro to UX class. She's one of the world's experts in this stuff. So your project in this class is to conduct your own usability evaluation. You get her class and thousands more Skillshare classes with your membership. It's unlimited. And you get two months of Skillshare Premium for free by using my link in the description. And after that, it's just $10 a month for an annual subscription. It's a steal. It's a new year, and a new skill can bring all kinds of new things to your life. Sure has for mine. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, and get excited for that cake recipe. I'm gonna break all your fitness resolutions.